today. On my far right, Kelly Cummings, Director of State Operations. My immediate right, Melissa DeRosa, Secretary to the Governor. To my left, Robert Meek, a Budget Director. To his left, uh, our esteemed Health Commissioner, Dr. Howard Zucker. We have a lot of announcements today, so let's just start. As you know, the state is working on two goals as a primary focus. First, managing COVID and the vaccination process, et cetera. Second, reimagining re New York and rebuilding New York. Uh, we don't just automatically rebound post-COVID, in my opinion. Uh, you have an illness, you then have to go through rehab. We have to rehabilitate New York. We have to work to bring New York back. It's not spontaneous. Uh, government can come up with big projects to spur the economy, provide business aid, provide tenant aid. That's what we're doing. That's reimagining New York better than ever before. Uh, but it's not an automatic recovery post-COVID not at the rate we want it. But on both fronts, we are doing great. Uh, well, you're the governor, of course, you're gonna say that. Uh, no, if you look at the data, we're doing great. Uh, the positivity today is 0.66, 799 people in hospitals. I mean, just remember where we were just a few months ago. January, 7.9, almost 8%. Today, we are at 0.51%. 63 straight days of decline. Across the state, Finger Lakes has the highest, but again, look at that range, 0.98 from uh, less than half that in other parts of the state. New York City, the Bronx, 0.57 has the highest. Uh, New York's progress is extraordinary and exceptional. It has the lowest positivity, one of the lowest positivities of any state in the United States, okay? Uh, so that is saying something. 10 straight days of record low positivity. Every region is below 1%. We have never been in a better position vis-a-vis -vis COVID than we are today. And uh, I have such respect for the actions of New Yorkers because New Yorkers are the ones who determine the positivity rate, et cetera. And they have done a fantastic job. Not only is the positivity coming down, the vaccinations are going up. And the two are linked, right? They are opposite curves. As vaccinations go up, positivity goes down. And that's what we are seeing. Vaccinations now 19 million, 10 million with at least one dose, 9 million fully vaccinated. According to the CDC, we have done more shots in arms per capita than any big state in the country. We're at 68.6, but who's counting? We're counting. That's why we know 68.6. Wow, that's great. It is great, but it's not enough, and we have to do more. The light at the end of the tunnel is to remove the remaining COVID restrictions, right? Get to a point where COVID is not inhibiting our society, not inhibiting our growth. To do that, we have to be at 70%. When we hit 70%, then I feel comfortable saying to the people of this state, we can relax virtually all restrictions. We're at 68.6, almost there, but this is in horseshoes. We want to be at 70%, 1.4% to go. And then we can lift the capacity restrictions, social distancing, uh, the hygiene protocols, the health screenings, the potential tracing. Uh, masks will only be required as recommended by the CDC. There will be still will be some institutional uh, 
guidelines, large venues, schools, public transportation, hospitals, nursing homes. Uh, but we had 70 percent. We will be back to life as normal or as normal as you can be post-COVID. So how do you get the vaccinations up? And the vaccination rate has slowed dramatically, which is obvious. The higher you get, the fewer people there are to get vaccinated. And the lowest vaccination demographic is still the 12 to 17 because um, they just became eligible. And we just spent a year telling them this is not really about you. It's about older people. So we're trying to get it up in the 12 to 17 group. But focus on the places that have low vaccination rates. Well, how do you know where you have low vaccination rates? Study the data. Uh, we have 1,700 zip codes in the state of New York, OK? If you look at the zip codes by vaccination rate, the bottom 10 percent of the zip codes are below 36 percent, OK? The overall vaccination rate in the state is 68. So these zip codes are like almost half of the vaccination rate. Target those areas. Remember when we, when we went through the hospital vaccination protocol early on and we couldn't get the hospital numbers up? And I then literally did the numbers by hospital. And now people knew that we were looking at hospital numbers and there was more accountability. We're going to do the same thing with zip codes. Yes, we're working statewide, but we're going to focus on these zip codes. And I want everybody focusing on these zip codes because uh, they're dramatically different. This is starting with the lowest percentage of vaccinations, right? Uh, Muncie in Rockland County, Romulus in Seneca County, Monroe in Orange County, Spring Valley in well, Monroe and Orange, and then Rochester and Monroe. It's a little confusing. Monroe in Orange County, Rochester in Monroe County. Uh, Spring Valley, Evans Mill, Frankenville, Gowanda, Far Rockaway, Queens. Uh, Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Uh, Rochester City in Monroe. Ocean Hill, Brooklyn. Canarsie, Brooklyn. Brownsville, Brooklyn. Buffalo, City of Buffalo and Erie County. Crown Heights, Brooklyn, Borough Park, Brooklyn, uh, Delavan and Cattaraugus, Baychester in the Bronx, uh, Addison and Stu Bend, Fort Plain, Montgomery, Hunts Point in the Bronx, uh, Jefferson County, Marine Park, which surprises me. Um, and if you have, this is not just a remainder of the zip codes and their vaccination rates. It is also an IQ test. Who can read the top county or town? Anybody? OK. Then uh, you'll have to look at it on the website. We'll skip this chart. But that is the remainder of the zip codes uh, of the 176. And we're going to be focusing on those. To the county health departments and local governments, I say, Focus your resources there. That is where we have the greatest chance for advancement. And the local governments have the resources because the vaccination rate is way down. We don't have enough people coming into vaccination centers to justify having the centers open right now. We have centers open all day and two, three, four people show up. So redeploy those assets to these zip codes because that's where it can make a difference. On the issue of schools, the numbers show that the risk of transmission by children is extremely low, especially in this state, which has an extremely low positivity rate. You have states in this nation that have multiples of our positivity rate. We spoke with the CDC. 
There, they have policy guidance for schools nationwide. So their policy guidance is for the lowest positivity rate state and the highest positivity rate state. Uh, they're not going to change their guidance for several weeks. In New York State, we're going to modify the CDC guidance and allow schools to choose no mask outside for children. In other words, children wear masks in school inside. When they're outside of the school building, in recess, et cetera, it's hot, they're running around, but they're outside. Uh, there is no mandate for masks outside. We'll leave that up to the local school district. Uh, we spoke to CDC, and CDC uh, is, has no objection to that and is fine with it. This will allow us to align camp and school guidance. Uh, to me, it's very important that people understand the logic between these decisions and that it's uh, rational and based on the science and the data. We've asked people to do all sorts of extraordinary things. Uh, we've had all sorts of regulations. But I always could look right in the camera and say, this makes sense for the following reasons. We have a disconnect right now between the school guidance and the camp guidance. You send your child to camp, they don't have to wear a mask. You send your child to school, they have to wear a mask even outside. How do you square those two regulations? And I don't think you can. And that's important because if people don't think the rules are logical, then they're not going to want to follow the rules. So we're going to align them uh, for schools outside. If you can go to camp and run around and play volleyball and not wear a mask, you in the playground in school, you can uh, not wear a mask. Inside school is obviously different. And then it's up to the local school districts. Also for schools, they should now be vaccinating 12 to 17-year-olds. They are in the school. They're there now. You have them in one place. They are a captive audience, so to speak. You have a nurse in the school. Or you have a local government that can send the vaccination team to the school. We're closing vaccination sites redeploy them to the school. Get them vaccinated now. Parental permission slip, and then vaccinate the child. Once summer vacation happens, they're gone. They go home, they're in the neighborhood, they're able to go on vacation, they go to camp, who knows where they go. But you have them right now in the building. And you want to start the new school year in September with a clean slate, get them vaccinated now. It makes no sense. Connecticut did something called the Ferris Bueller Day Off. Who remembers Ferris Bueller Day Off? Well, you are a non participatory. Do you remember, Zach? I very clearly. You remind me of Ferris Bueller, <laughs> by the way, I'm saying. But Connecticut did a Ferris Bueller day off. If you get vaccinated, you get the rest of the day off. Get creative. And, but get those 12 to 17 year olds vaccinated now. We will, it will make reopening the schools much safer and much easier. And I think every school should be doing that uh, right now. If they don't have a nurse, and if the local health department can't do it, the state will do it. But get it done now. It's a golden opportunity. And the world is open for the vaccinated. For the vaccinated. There are benefits of vaccination. Uh, Radio City Music Hall, 100% vaccinated. Sports teams 
are increasing the number of seats that they're going to have for vaccinated people. Uh, you want to go see the Nets? You want to see the Islanders? They're increasing the number of seats. I told you this was going to happen because the venue wants to sell more seats. And the unvaccinated section, you have to leave seats empty. Unvaccinated, you don't. So you see it at sports games. You see it at concerts. Uh, Empire State Building is doing something creative. They are offering people with Excelsior passes. The Excelsior pass is the app that shows you got vaccinated. $10 off on observatory tickets. They're going to have exclusive access hours where people will know everybody there is vaccinated, which I believe is going to increase attendance because people will feel more comfortable. And then they're going to do a special event just for vaccinated people. And I think this is great. I want to say to people, get vaccinated. And there are benefits to vaccination besides the obvious ones. Yes, he your health, your family's health, et cetera. Plus, it's a passport to fully enjoy life. Empire State Realty Trust is also doing something else where if you have an Excelsior Pass, they're going to make uh, entrance into the office building much, much simpler and much easier. Uh, and they're going to be doing that with 11 buildings across uh, the state. I recommend uh, many office complexes follow this precedent. If a person is vaccinated, they are safe. I have no problem with a different set of rules for people who are vaccinated. We have to hit 70. When we hit 70, it's going to be a day to celebrate and the restrictions will come off and the Empire State Building will be blue and gold and all the state assets will be blue and gold. And we can say, we did it. We did it. We went from the highest infection rate on the globe to one of the lowest positivity rates on the globe and to one of the highest vaccination rates on the globe. A turnaround story uh, that has never been seen in this state. And we save thousands and thousands of lives in the meantime. We do it when we do it together, and we will. And we're going to be better than ever. Questions? No, there was no confusion with the schools. We said on Friday we were asking the CDC for guidance and we would tell the schools on Monday what the guidance was, uh, which I just did. We never said on Monday anything goes into effect. I said on Monday I will tell you after we talk to the CDC and we talked to the CDC, and uh, they agreed with our decision to lift the mask mandate outside. Pete? Well, Governor, well, but you released the uh, Commissioner Zucker's letter to the CDC, and that letter itself said that um, the guidance was going to be effective Monday, and that if the CDC had any contrary data or science that they wanted to provide before Monday, then yeah. there might be a change. Yes, that's what I just said. But I was just you know, wondering, just what on my first question. I said we would tell you Monday what the uh, CDC said, and if the CDC had any contrary information, that they would tell us uh, Monday. Dr. Zucker, do you want to comment on that? Right, it's, it's exactly, it's just as the governor said, we spoke to the CDC. The CDC uh, received our, our letter, my letter. Uh, they. Um, we to spoke to them again this morning, uh, and we will uh, get rid of the masks outdoors for the kids in school. Uh, and they are looking at what they want to do for at a federal level, uh, but they don't have an answer at this point yet. Like, Rob, do you? Let me just get the uh, second part of your question. Rob, do you have the? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> for large venues, they should be verifying uh, vaccine status for the large venues, so that those are still in place. Which also for the unvaccinated sections, you still require 
Uh, masks are still required. Social distancing is still required. In the unvaccinated sections, office buildings, you still have social distancing required uh, for the unvaccinated as well as mask requirements. Uh, restaurants still have uh, capacity restrictions as well and social distancing restrictions. Those are all the ones that the governor is talking about would be all lifted once uh, the you hit 70 percent uh, with the exception of the very large venues and those the capacity restrictions stay in place there and mask restrictions would stay in place. Governor, just to talk about the 70 percent quickly, um, I know you don't have a crystal ball, you said that many times, but this 70 percent number that we're talking about means a world of difference for a lot of people. Do you have any estimate whatsoever? I know you have to redeploy uh, resources and try to get those who are not vaccinated vaccinated, but do you have any estimate of when we might be able to hit the 70 percent? That is a good question. I don't have the answer, but I am willing to guess. Uh, even more than that, I'm willing to ask people to estimate. Dr. Zucker, Robert Mejica, what day do you think we will hit 70 percent? No one has a crystal ball on this. We're driving uh, pretty aggressively. What the governor mentioned about the zip codes, we get into those zip codes, we get more people vaccinated, uh, we'll get there, get there sooner. We're making an all-out effort to get as many people vaccinated as possible. We're at very close to that number. So I don't want to give you a That's date. a politician's oh, answer. Politician's <laughs> answer. With you You're a time. doctor. <laughs> yes. That's the answer I give. Give me a number. What's your guess? It's what, a guess. What do I think? July. Uh, first week of July. First week in July? Yeah. What's your guess? Uh, the end of next week. End of next week? So you're saying? Like June 17th, 18th. 13 days? I'm saying, does anyone else have a guess? I think a week from today. Oh, seven? From today. 10. I am saying eight. Days. So you require, still require masks on uh, mass transit? Yes. 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 Uh, if transmission rates in schools are as low as they are, why not give the district the option of letting kids go maskless inside? CDC thinks that is not advisable. Governor, that is, that was posed in the question. Uh, we ask them, what do you think in the case of New York? Remember, the CDC is setting a policy for the entire nation. So you have New York on one end, one of the lowest positivity, and then you have states that have like four or five times our positivity. They have to cover both. Uh, we talk to them about the in-school mask and the outside school mask rule. Uh, they were comfortable with the outside mask requirement. They were not comfortable with the inside mask requirement. Do you think that's fair? But you're modifying the outside. Why not modify for the inside? The, they make a good case on the inside uh, and the potential hazards on the inside. And there's only a couple of weeks left, Pete. So we don't want to make any mistakes. But the outside, uh, I don't understand how you can rationalize that with the camp guidance and it's outside. Do you want to make a point? One of the other points that the CDC makes for the inside, and Dr. Zucker, feel free to correct me, but the schools have spent a lot of time doing specific configurations for classrooms, and if you were to now go maskless or allow for maskless, they think that you would have to reconsider all of that, and as the governor noted, there's only about two weeks left. And so they think the safest course is to keep the masks on indoor for now, and then they can revisit going into the fall when there's more time to prepare. Yeah, that's a good point. That's, that's one of the uh, pegs they, they hung their hat on. You would have to do a whole new set of guidance. You only have two weeks. You'd have to communicate with all the parents. You'd have to communicate with the teachers uh, and leave it alone for two weeks, but get it ready for September is basically what they so said. The Adult Survivors Act passed the Senate last week. In the assembly right now, we give a one-year look-back period for civil suits for survivors of sexual assault and harassment. Um, will you sign the bill if the assembly passes it, and how might that affect someone like you facing these types of allegations? Well, we'd have to see the bill, and then we take it from there. You haven't seen the bill? 
No, because a bill has to be passed. What do you think, do you think about that? What do you think? How might that affect you, given, given the allegations? Well, it depends on what the bill says. It's a one-year look-back period for civil rights. Yeah, I know, but then it has to be passed by the Assembly, and it depends on what they do with the bill uh, and what changes they would make, and then you look at a bill once it's passed. Go ahead. Do you have any priorities at all going as you know the legislative session is going to wrap up this week? Is there anything you'd like to see them do? And how would you describe kind of your overall engagement this sort of second half of that session? Are you very involved in negotiating? You know, as usual, Zach, uh, probably more so this year, we did a tremendous amount of work in the budget. Uh, and I think it's fair to say. Our, my priorities were done in the budget. Uh, I think the majority of the Senate and the Assembly's priorities were done in the budget. Uh, so there are a few bills that are being considered. For me, the main thing to get done are the appointments and the Senate confirmations of the appointees. That's really my priority. Governor. Ms. Kramer? So I have two questions, Governor. The first one has to you be... You only get one... No, I'm see, Marcia, you two, can't just you say because you, you get to... Okay. So the first one has to do with vaccines, and I noticed that your zip code list on the lowest 25%, a lot of those communities have been the hardest hit by COVID. So my first question is what you're going to do to try to target them to get their vaccination rates up. And my second question, so I'm going to get it in before you talk, because <laughs> I know you. Yeah, you do. Um, is this. So there's been a lot of violence in New York, culminating this past weekend in the killing of a 10-year-old. And the gun crimes continue unabated. Nothing seems to help. The mayor of the city of New York today blamed everybody, including the federal government, for not stopping the flow of guns. And the state, meaning you, because of parole, because there's um, your parole rules. People get paroled. They come back. They have no support net, uh, a safety net, no jobs, nothing, and they commit crimes. So I wonder whether you think the city is itself is doing enough to try to stop the, the gun violence. And secondly, do you think it's a fair criticism to say that, that the parole laws, your parole laws, are the cause of the gun violence in New York City? Yeah. Uh, short answer to the second question is no, but let me do the first question and go back. Uh, what I'm asking, which I've asked before in the past, let's all focus, target these zip codes city, state, voluntary organizations, churches, community-based organizations, focus SWAT teams on these zip codes. Uh, and because that's a real chance, the numbers are very low, we can get a significant increase there. On crime, and let me be clear, because people are now uh, in the midst of selecting a mayor. The, I understand a political campaign. I've been in a few of them. Uh, I've always believed if you try to make everyone happy, you wind up making no one happy. If you try to do everything, you wind up doing nothing. Uh, I understand in New York City everything is important. Education is important and the environment is important and the economy is important and I get that. I think there are two priorities right now in New York City. Crime slash gun violence and homelessness. Marsha, it does not matter what I do to spur the economy. New LaGuardia Airport, new JFK Airport, more construction than ever before, new MTA, uh, new Pier 76, new Penn Station. We are building a future that people in New York City, New York State, but New York City should say, wow, can you believe this? We're going to have the first new airport in 25 years at LaGuardia, and then JFK, and then a train from LaGuardia into the city, and a new Penn Station, and I was in Moynihan Train Hall. It's phenomenal. Crime comes first. If people believe the city is not safe, you don't get past that point. You look at periods of growth in this city, it's always periods where you had perceived low crime rates. Right now, you have 
high crime rates in reality and in perception. We're doing a new tourism campaign. Come to New York State, one of the safest COVID states in the United States. Right? Oh, New York State is safe? Oh, maybe it's safe from COVID, but it's not safe from crime. Look at the front page of the newspapers. That is the number one issue. You never solve a problem that you deny. Uh, there is no doubt but that we have a chronic problem with the relationship between the NYPD and members of the community. There is no doubt. Uh, you're in denial if you don't see that issue. That's why I required every police department and jurisdiction in this state to do a reform plan because there is a problem. There is a lack of trust. It's frustrating the police. It's frustrating the community. That is where it starts. Gun violence is now a second social disease. Treat it the way you treated COVID. It's going to take all of us together to end gun violence. All of us. Yes, police. Yes, better relations. Yes, police reform. Yes, police that you respect. Yes, police who can do their job. But then we have to say as a city, enough is enough. And there has to be leadership where we say the way we wore a mask to protect one another, we're now going to fight gun violence to protect one another. It has to be that level of awareness. This is beyond the pale. Homelessness is related to this mentality. You and I both know, we have seen this cycle. We've seen it. This is not the first time we had homeless. We had homeless problems. Juliet remembers. We had homeless problems. And we basically resolved them. I did the commission for David Dinkins. I did the homeless plan. And he accepted it. I was the HUD secretary for Bill Clinton. I did a homeless plan that received the highest award from Harvard University, Kennedy School. We know how to do it. We have done it. We're not doing it now. There's a philosophy that says you're mentally ill, uh, you're in a subway, you're on the street. Well, that's your decision, you're mentally ill. No, we care about you more than that. Mental illness is an illness. If you had COVID, we would help you. If you have mental illness, we have to help you. The, the uh, compassion is not saying, OK, you're mentally ill. You can sleep there on the grate because we care about you and your rights. No. If you're mentally ill, we're going to help you. We're going to bring you to a shelter that can get you help and a shelter that is safe. You know what the homeless say to me all the time? And I've been working on this, as you know, since I was 26. 26. I was the largest homeless provider for families in the nation. I know this practically. Homeless say, I don't want to go into a shelter. It's too dangerous. I said, but you're sleeping here on the street, great. They say, better than a shelter. You're sleeping here in a subway car. Anybody could come by, stab you. Better than a shelter. come out of this. Number one, are you saying that Mayor de Blasio is not showing the proper leadership to deal with the problems that we have right now? And number two, because we are in a mayoral campaign and half of the mayoral candidates approximately are saying defund the police and half are saying no, we can't do that. So what would you say to people who have to cast their votes in terms of how they want the police to be handled in the future by the future mayor? Look, uh, as far as the mayor is concerned, and you know what I think about him, and you know what, frankly, most New Yorkers think about him, right? I'm just, I'm just with the majority. 
of New Yorkers. I'm a Queens boy, uh, so I'm, I'm with the Queens boys and the Bronx boys and the Manhattan women. Uh, not thrilled. The, the reality is the reality. I get up and I give you the numbers on COVID. I say it's 0.5. Either I'm doing well in my COVID management or I'm not doing well. It's in the numbers. Crime is in the numbers. Homelessness is in the numbers. Uh, it's a fact. It's a fact. If we, I say to you today, we have the second highest, second lowest positivity in the United States of America. That's a fact. There's one state and then there's New York. Judge me on the fact. The crime statistics and homeless statistics and the reality of walking down a street in New York is a fact. What I'm trying to say, and that's yesterday, it's going to be about the next mayor. And what do they see as a fact? And what are they going to do about it? And as a voter, I'm saying focus on two issues, crime, homelessness. The economy will come back. If it's not being stopped by crime and quality of life, you look at all we're doing to stimulate the economy, billion dollars into small business, hundreds of millions into tenant relief, it will come back. All these big projects that we're doing, it will come back. Crime, quality of life, homeless, is an artificial ceiling where people say, I'm not going to visit New York. Get, people are getting shot all over the place. Uh, I'm not going to invest in my small business. Uh, I'm worried about crime. Uh, I'm not going to buy an apartment in that neighborhood. There's homeless people on the street corner who are throwing rocks. It has to be addressed. I do not agree with defund the police. New Yorkers will make that decision, and they have. Governor, Sir, Governor, one more. There was a protest one in, in, um, uh, at the regional DEC uh, headquarters in Avon. Avon, did I pronounce that right? Avon, uh, New York, this weekend. Um, they were protesting the Greenwich power plant, which is uh, doing the proof of work uh, energy grid that they claim is basically sucking uh, the energy in, in the entire region in Seneca Lake. There are two bills pending right now in Albany. One basically uh, stops it from increasing its power, uh, all this for Bitcoin mining, right? And the other basically uh, halts the process to expand. Are you familiar with it? Where do you stand on it? What's, you know, what should be done about the Bitcoin mining industry and these, uh, these local plants that are being bought up that were former coal mines uh, that are basically melting the sun at the moment? That's at least what they're claiming. Yeah, I am familiar with the general issue. I don't know about any bills on the topic or where they are. I don't know if Kelly does. Melissa? No. I'm not you have stumped the panel. That very rarely happens. Didn't mean to. But in this case, you have stumped the panel. Uh, we will find out and we will get back to you this afternoon. For the point of clarity, for the, for the point of clarity, uh, I just want to make sure who said what. No, you cannot change. Just in general, sorry, the Bitcoin mining industry, right? Which is yes. a, a major source of contention because of the overwhelming amount of energy that it uses. Forget the bills for a second. Where do you uh, stand on that in general, or the, the, uh, the issue uh, of the fact there that There are serious concerns. There are no doubt about that. There are serious concerns. And I'll look at the legislation. You mean I'm the Delta variant? Friday is the 18th. Friday is the 18th? Yeah. So my date is the 18th. So you're 13 days. Okay, your 13 days, you are, yeah, it's too bad, too late, you can't change. 13 days, what was your number? Three weeks. I said uh, 
I said eight days. Melissa said seven days. I said a week and a half. You said ten days. Okay. Remember those numbers.